Well, it seems the general election isn't too far away, with Downing Street insisting it's the only way to break the Brexit deadlock in Parliament. The earliest it could take place is towards the end of November. Our chief political correspondent, Vicky Young, takes a look at some of the key constituencies that could determine the result. We're in a period of pretty unpredictable politics and the current makeup of the House of Commons suggests a general election may not be that far away. Let's take a look at the state of the parties right now. The Conservatives have 288 MPs and Labour 247. There are 35 independents, more than half of them former Conservative MPs, booted out of the Parliamentary Party for voting against the government. The SNP has 35 and the Liberal Democrats 17. With all the others, that's a total of 650 and no party is anywhere near the required 326 for an overall majority. So what's likely to be the Tories' election strategy? Well, in 2017, the two main parties dominated, the Tories taking 43% and Labour 41% of the vote. Compare that to how the parties are polling now. The Conservatives have had a poll bounce under Boris Johnson, but are still averaging around 33%. Labour are down to about 26% in September's polls. So let's take a look at the electoral map from 2017. If the current polls were reflected in a general election, the Conservatives would take 24 seats off Labour, places like Kensington, Dudley North and Newcastle under Lyme. But at the same time, they risk losing seats. Places like Stirling and Gordon in Scotland would likely go to the SNP, Cheltenham, Southport and Winchester to the Liberal Democrats. So the Conservatives need to take more seats from Labour and they'll have their eyes on the ones that voted for Brexit. Looking at the Conservatives' top 50 Labour-held targets, it's estimated that 39 voted Leave. Places like Stoke-on-Trent North with a 72% Leave vote, Blackpool South 68% or Great Grimsby 71% Leave. But will historical anti-Tory feeling here undermine this strategy? That'll be one of the key features of an election. And the other unknown is the potential impact of Nigel Farage's Brexit party. Could it damage the Tories' chances by winning the support of Leave voters? Vicky Young there. Let's talk to our deputy political editor, John Pina, who's at Westminster. John, David Cameron, the former prime minister, who, of course, held the Brexit referendum in 2016, is now broken his silence on the current Brexit impasse. And how, Clive? We've seen past prime ministers take pot shots at their successors, but never anything quite like this. David Cameron's about to release his memoirs, and he's given a brutally plain spoken interview to The Times. In the book, he describes his now former friend, Michael Gove, the cabinet minister for no deal planning, as mendacious, a liar, in other words. He describes him and Boris Johnson as having left the truth at home during the EU referendum campaign, having behaved appallingly. And he's scathing about the decision to expel rebels from the, from the, from the, uh, the parliamentary party and stop them standing as candidates. And as for suspending parliament, he calls that sharp practice, a sort of old fashioned term for trickery, for cheap trickery. Now, this is a row of a kind we haven't quite seen before. It compounds the row that's going on just at the moment. And we're now looking at a former Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, in court. Has there John Major challenging Boris Johnson in court? Has there ever Major challenging Boris Johnson in court? Has there ever been a Prime Minister as polarising and divisive as the one we're seeing now in modern times? It's true that those closest to Boris Johnson in Number 10 Downing Street believe these divisions may work for him and help convince Brexiteer voters that Mr Johnson is on their side. But if the Prime Minister hoped to deliver what some have called a clean break Brexit and to reunify the country afterwards, well, surely now achieving either one of those ambitions, let alone both of them, looks like an uphill slog. OK, John, thank you. John Pinar there at Westminster.